people time to file in and we'll get straight into it. I hope everybody is uh, doing well, of course, having a good morning, afternoon, or evening. Poor audio. Um, audio check, all right. Good. Also, everybody, thank you for coming and attending. It uh, definitely means uh, quite a bit to us to have so many participants here. Uh, we're definitely excited to talk about the subject. So likewise, it is very exciting to see that everybody is ready and excited to listen to it. It's all good. Is my sound okay, Cody? Uh, yes, your sound is okay. okay. Um, let me go ahead and... Uh, All right, it is webinar time. We will be beginning in just a moment here. Oh, here you have to take this off. Oh, dear. All right, uh, it is 10.01. Uh, we do have um, support in the chat to help with potential audio issues. So those of um, us who are not able to hear will be helped. Uh, one moment. Right. Um, okay. We're going to go ahead and get started here while also concurrently working on the audio issues. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. Again, thank you for attending this presentation in our BNC webinar series. This is an unclassified presentation, which means the contents can be freely distributed. In fact, we will be uploading this to our YouTube channel after the fact. If you wanted to review any slides or, for instance, if you missed any of the information due to any video or audio issues, you can find the link to our YouTube channel at the very top of the chat in that hypertext link. We definitely appreciate any and all questions and we'll be answering them in the following segment after the main presentation. Today's lead presenter is Paul Skotanis from Psionics. Berkeley Nucleonics is the proud North American representative for their state-of-the-art custom scintillation detectors. It makes us very happy to say that in 20. 20, we definitely saw a large surge in the amount of concurrent conversations involved, and it is very exciting, but at the same time, it does pose new challenges. For instance, while we are happy to have all of those conversations, one of the things we noted is that while providing worldwide sales and service, we found that information could be slightly kaleidoscopic. There were things that could potentially help some requesters and some customers that weren't apparent to them because that information was embedded in other conversations or other product lines. So the reason why we hold these webinars and also host our BNC Academy is to kind of create an information base that is elevated above that business network. So again, we sincerely appreciate all of you coming out to listen to this presentation. And without further ado, I would like to give it away to Paul Skotanis to begin discussing Compton suppressors. Thank you, Cody. Happy to be here today. 
Today we're going to be talking about Compton suppression. I will introduce you to the Compton effect in materials and show you how we can design Compton suppression shields to improve the quality of your gamma ray spectrometers. I will show you how we design Compton suppression shields using different scintillation materials. And also I'll briefly go into some other ways to reduce cosmic ray background in your gamma ray spectra. So what is Compton suppression? Compton suppression is a technique to reduce the background in a germanium detector, or for that matter, a high resolution scintillator, gamma ray spectrometer. You all know that gamma ray interacts with matter in different ways. It can interact either via the photoelectric conversion, where we see the full energy coming into a peak, or via Compton effect. In a Compton effect, we don't see peaks, we see a continuum. And this continuum shows up at a lower energy than the main energy. For example, if you take a look to the spectrum to the right, you see a simple cobalt-60 spectrum in a germanium detector, the best high-resolution detector we have these days. You see that there are two peaks at 1332 and 1173 keV, and below that you see a continuum. That's the Compton continuum. Actually, that part of the spectrum doesn't give us information on the energy of the primary radiation. It's just a nuisance, actually. But it's always there because the Compton effect plays an important role in materials that don't have an extremely high Z, like germanium, for example. So for example, if we have a gamma ray line at a high energy, it'll give you this Compton background, and this prevents us to see a weak line at a lower energy. So that's the reason that actually we love to get rid of that Compton background in our spectra. Compton suppression shields can give you that possibility. The Compton effect is ruled by some equations, simply conservation of energy and momentum. For example, the maximum Compton scattered energy is the equation at the top. You can very simply calculate that. And you can see that maximum energy in the cobalt sexy spectrum there in the top in the small humps you see there. There are two humps. One of them is the Compton maximum energy at 1332, and the other one, 1173. Compton scattering goes in all directions, and the energy is also angle dependent. So there are several sorts of background in a germanium detector or a high resolution scintillator. The Compton background I've just discussed. There's also an external cosmic background. All kinds of muons come from the top, from the sun, and mainly here on Earth. And they fly through our detector and through the Earth for a large part also and they generate a background in our system. That's another way of background, which I'll shortly talk about at the end of this presentation. And of course, there's always some internal natural contamination in our detector, it's unavoidable. Also a germanium detector or a high resolution scintillator has a housing, there's a minute amount of contaminants in there. That's not a source of background. Actually, the Compton background depends very much on the interaction material and the gamma ray energy. And this graph to the top right gives you a little an idea at what kind of Z of material, what kind of energies the Compton effect and the photo effect plays an important role. So roughly below 250 keV, Compton effect becomes really important. And if you Z of your material increases, this energy goes up. So we shouldn't forget that also Compton background can originate from the shielding around your detector. To the left, you see a a nice graphical representation of all kinds of background in a radiation detector. X-rays from the shielding, cosmic rays, Compton effect, etc. It's a whole complex story. So a high resolution germanium detector can really be improved by Compton suppression shields, but also a scintillation detector, like a high resolution scintillator, like cerium bromide, for example. So what's the trick? The trick is to catch as much as possible of the Compton scattered gamma rays that escape your primary detector. The top right, you see a germanium detector. It's a very old picture, but it doesn't matter. And the sample is in the middle, uh, at the top of the germanium detector. And you see an annulus of scintillator around this germanium detector. And the thing to the right, we call a plug. I'll show you again this picture a little later. 
So in this configuration, we have surrounded the germanium detector with scintillator to catch all these scattered gamma rays. When we catch those gamma rays, we can set the veto pulse to prevent the actually detection of the scattered rays. So the signals from the shield are used as a veto using the proper electronics. And this reduces actually the counts in the Compton continuum. Don't forget that the effect is angle dependent and energy dependent. So the procedure is to find, to simulate or to calculate where the scattered energy goes and to design your shield so that you catch most of that scattered gamma rays. It always starts with the germanium detector. You have to look at your configuration of your germanium detector. And in these pictures, I showed them with the Dewar, but they can also have a cryo cooler, of course. And you have to see how can I cover this germanium detector as much as possible with a compton suppression shield. You have to define the thickness of the shield, and you have to chew this very carefully. And you have to find the best scintillator for uh, the specific application. Actually, there are two main applications of Compton suppression. One application is low background measurements, for example, environmental samples within a big lead shielding. And in that case, we usually choose sodium iodide because of its low background properties in a housing of aluminum or low background stainless steel. That's one particular application. Here you see again a uh, graphic representation of such an annulus shield, the germanium detector, and the thing to the right we call the plug detector. Uh, and actually the sample is, is in the middle. So the way we operate this system is that you remove the plug, put the sample in the right location, then put back the plug, and then you can start your measurement. The second application actually is gamma ray spectroscopy and nuclear physics. It's a different application. Usually we don't have we don't have a sample there. We have often radiation that comes from a target, beams with a very mixed uh, energy, uh, gamma ray energies. And usually you try to position more high resolution germanium detectors around the target. And because the energies tend to be a little larger, up to maybe seven or 10 MeV sometimes, um, we use BGO as a scintillator there because it's a very high density and we can make those things very compact. So we can put the germanium detectors very close to the target and still putting some BGO shields between them. In the middle, you see an example of such com complex gamma ray spectra. And you see a cross section of a typical uh, suppression shield for a physics application. It has a tapered nose cone also to detect uh, gamma rays that are scattered backwards. You want to prevent that radiation hits the scintillator directly. So it's possible to mount a collimator on the top on the front of this uh, shield that can be either lead or tungsten. Uh, in this particular case, you also see that at the back side, we have mounted a scintillator, we call the back catcher. Sometimes that's not possible because your germanium attack simply doesn't allow it because the cryostat has the wrong shape. But it, basically it is possible to uh, manufacture these devices. They are made out of two half shells you can mount around the cold finger. The shield, you see there at the top how it really looks like. And you see there the cables are kept very short because the space is often very limited at the backside of the uh, shield. So the best scintillator for a Compton suppression seal depends a lot on your application. As said, for energies are roughly below 2.6 MeV, we choose usually low background material like sodium iodide. And for physics applications, we usually choose BGO. Well, the thickness of which the really need of the scintillator depends on the maximum gamma ray energy that you are expecting in all directions. A rule of thumb is that for energies up to roughly 3 MeV, you need about 5 centimeter of sodium iodide and about roughly 25 to 30 millimeter of BGO. Too little scintillator means that the scattered gamma rays will escape from your annulus. You don't detect them. This means less good suppression. And too much scintillator 
leads to unnecessary high cost and a very heavy system, of course. So the myelite crystals mounted around germanium detectors as suppression shields are grown easily up to 300 millimeter diameter. So these crystals can be made out of one piece, which we drill a hole to the germanium detector sits in the middle. The BGO, the story is a little different because BGO crystals cannot be grown so large and usually made up out of segments. In the top right, you see a cross section, how these things are being constructed. Usually we use trapeziums, we mount them very closely together and every trapezium shaped BGO crystal is read out with a separate light detector, usually a photomultiplier tube. Most compass suppression shields are actually custom designed. It always starts with the dimension of your germanium detector. And it's very important if you ask us to design a shield for you, that you give us a drawing of your germanium detector so we can look at it and design the optimal configuration for your specific application. There are not so many manufacturers of germanium detectors, a handful, and those drawings are really crucial to start the whole design process. Cryostats sometimes are in the angle, horizontal, vertical. There are many possibilities. And this also means that we have very many different possibilities to design Compton suppression shields. You see, for example, one configuration to the left, where we even have the BGO on the side, BGO side well, we call this. Second one is a tapered one, also BGO with a nose cone. Then we have a large annulus with little photomultiplier tubes to have as little background as possible. Or we simply can use a straight annulus, a straight ring of scintillator. In this case, it's BGO. In case of very low background applications, you can decide of using either low background stainless steel or OFHC copper housings. To the very right, you see an extremely highly segmented uh, suppression shield used around a segmented germanium detector. There, every segment is read out separately and it's all used to extract more information from the whole process. So a good question, of course, what determines actually the Compton suppression factor? How much can I reduce this background by putting a scintillator around my primary detector? First of all, it depends on the geometric detection efficiency. How much solid angle can I really cover around my uh, primary detector? And of course, the scintillator detection efficiency. Is it enough to catch all my scattered gamma rays? And very important, the lowest scattered gamma ray energy that I can detect in the system, in the shield. You may not expect it, but the suppression factor is a strong function on the threshold you are able to set. Of course, electronic settings are also important. And in the electronic system, of course, we have to set the gates in such a way that in a timing, in the time domain, it's all adjusted correctly. The suppression factor depends very much between systems. It's energy dependent. You can imagine that because of the thickness is fixed of the shield. And for most systems, it lies between a factor of five and 10. Sometimes you can achieve higher numbers, but this is a very rough number that you should be able to achieve with a good suppression shield. Again, the lower energy setting is very important. It's not that trivial because on large systems, you have large BGO crystals that don't, are not so very bright. And you have to choose the readout configuration very carefully in order to be able to see these low energies. In this spectrum, you see a PGO spectrum for a memoricium, 60 keV. And in this case, we can see nicely down to about 10, 20 keV, which is fine for the application. Actually, for a suppression factor, the resolution of your shield is actually of no importance. It's just important that you are able to veto the low energy scattered gamma rays. But of course, the inner resolution of your shield can give you extra information. To the right, you see a typical example of a unsuppressed spectrum and a suppressed spectrum from a germanium detector. To note that the photo peaks go really to the roof, uh, but it's just the Compton edge we are looking at. Of course, important when you want to detect the low energies is that the window of your suppression shield is also thin. So we usually use aluminum for that, 0.5 to 8.8 .8 millimeter. A 
a little word on electronics. In the past, everybody used NIMB-based electronics, setting the windows and uh, generating the veto pulses. But NIMB electronics is getting obsolete very quickly. And these days, we see a strong uh, development of digitizers, where we can directly digitize the pulses from as well the germanium detector as the suppression shield. Most of the psionics complex suppression shields can be powered by a single high voltage power supply. I'll show you a little later how we do that. But these digitizers are uh, widely available now and they make things a lot easier, although to uh, adjust them is a different story and it's different than you may be used to from the old days with NIM electronics. You should realize that many digitizers have an input impedance of 50 ohms, low impedance. Photomultiplier tubes are high ohmic output devices, which means you have to use a buffer amplifier to ensure that the output impedance of the suppression system is also 50 ohm. Otherwise, the signal will collapse dramatically. This is something we can integrate in the system where you can use a small external preamplifier. This is not really a problem. We should realize when you are designing a suppression shield, what is the input impedance of my electronics digitizer, or maybe you have an old fashioned system. So usually high voltage input and signals are daisy chained, which means if you have a shield, for example, consisting out of, let's say, eight segments, here an example is given with uh, eight PTO crystals, eight photomultiplier tubes. But we do it like this, that we have all the high voltage powers doubled, so you can daisy chain, as we say, the high voltage inputs. These are the red lines in the figure, and you can daisy chain also the signals and just hardly hard connect everything together. In this way, you can operate your system with a single high voltage input and get one signal output. Of course, if you are interested in the different signals due to some angle, angular information you want to extract, then you have to read, out, read them out separately. But if you're just interested in a suppression in general, good content suppression, then you can use the summed signal actually. If there's no space for the connectors on the backside of a detector, there are many possibilities. We can, for example, uh, go back to flying leads cables, or we can use external signal summation preamplifier modules. Like you see here at the left, this is black box there. It's a simple box where the adjustment, the voltage adjustments are done externally and not on the detector itself. But this uh, gives you a lot more flexibility. Again, it's very important that um, these things are custom designed so that they are optimized for the system you have. An interesting new technology I would like to inform you about is that we have these days silicon photomultipliers and on sodium iodide suppression shields, we can replace the photomultiplier tubes that we use for many years by silicon photomultipliers. And this means that the complete system can be powered by a single five volt power supply. And this solution really saves a lot of space uh, from the shielding. Here you see an example of such a system. To the right, you see the classic system. This is a big annulus actually, it's a sodium iodide shield. It's a nine inch shield, nine inch diameter crystal with a well of roughly 100 millimeter, I think. And you see it has four photomultiplier tubes on the annulus and we have a plug detector in the middle. So the germanium detector sits from the, goes up from the bottom and the sample is between the germanium detector and the plug detector. This is the classic solution. It is drawn on the same scale. On the left, you see the solution with silicon photomultipliers. You see it's a lot shorter. We don't have that extension with the photomultiplier tubes. Everything is just put in a very small housing. In the middle, you see the pulse height spectra from that big annulus, and you see the spectra from americium. Both these spectra are recorded with a source in the well in the middle, where the radiation also comes from when it is scattered out of the germanium detector. You see the resolution is, is quite nice. It's about 8.5%, I recall, for this system. And most important, the 60 keV peak is nicely resolved from the noise. These measurements are all done at room temperature, at, of course, 
very high temperatures, the story is different and the noise of the silicon photomultiplier starts to uh, become playing a role. But most systems actually like this are at laboratories. So it shows you here that with silicon photomultipliers, we can design sodium iodide suppression shields in a very elegant, compact way, powered by five volt. There are no high voltage power supplies needed. And at the same time, the amplifiers which we have inside have 50 ohm output impedance. So they're directly compatible to modern digitizers. A little about other sources of background. We have talked to now about Compton background, originating actually from the radiation you're looking at or from your sample. There's of course more background in Compton in the high resolution gamma ray spectrometers. And uh, well, the first source I already shortly uh, told you is internal contamination. Um, can be coming from the housing. It can come in the case of photomultiplier tubes from the glass of the photomultiplier. In case of silicon photomultipliers, we don't have that. This is a nice thing. And it can come from cosmic ray background. Those are the two other important sources of background in high resolution gamma ray spectrometers. You should realize that everything you bring with a germanium detector inside the shielding will increase the background. I mean the background due to internal contamination. So it's a fact that a Compton suppression shield will decrease background due to the content contribution, but it'll always induce a little background due to the fact that you're bringing material together with your germanium detector. To, to limit this as much as possible, it's important to use very pure materials, certified aluminium, low background for the multiplier tubes and any other materials inside your detector. Reflector materials, glues, etc. Another thing is that BGO has more internal background due to the intense intrinsic radioactivity of the material. I showed you earlier that for uh, natural background measurements, natural samples, environmental samples, we prefer sodium iodide because of this reason. You see, for example, here a background spectrum of a sodium iodide crystal. You see it is extremely clear. There's only one 511 kV peak, which is actually due to uh, pair formation due to cosmics. At the right, you see a spectrum from a, a BGO oscillator, and here you see three lines at roughly 600,000 and 1600 keV, which are intrinsic to uh, a bismuth contamination that is not possible to get rid of. So for low background systems, you always prefer sodium iodide. Other sources of background. Well, cosmic rays, as I said, fly through many materials. And even if you have your uh, setup in a basement, you still have cosmic rays there. And this gives you a continuum background. In the previous gamma ray spectra I showed you, you saw that there is a continuous uh, background there that's mainly due to the cosmics. And these cosmics you can uh, eliminate for a large part by mounting a plastic scintillator outside your lead shielding. In the spectrum to the left here, you see a typical cosmic ray spectrum depositing about 2 MeV in a per centimeter in a plastic scintillator. It's a continuum. And uh, actually, by mounting those plastic panels around your lead shielding, we can very effectively detect those cosmics and again uh, put them as a veto signal to prevent your, uh, the, uh, your, in your germanium detector to seeing those cosmic backgrounds. You have the trick there to mount the photomultiplier tube inside the plastic scintillator so that you only have to the outside a few wires or a connector. The cross section is shown here to the left. And those panels actually, just like compass suppression shields, are actually custom made and depends on the size of your LED shielding, the way you want to mount them, etc. That's it's extremely flexible. Do realize that these things tend to be very heavy. So these things are easily 25 kilo per piece, 10 to 25 kilo. Up to size of roughly 50 centimeter, 500 millimeter, you also can use silicon photomultipliers to read out these plastics. Um, the only advantage there is that it doesn't need a high voltage. Um, 
cost-wise, it's approximately uh, the same since the whole panel is actually read out with a single photovoltaic tube only. That brings me to my summary. Compton suppression is an attractive, easy technique to improve the quality of, high, of your high purity germanium spectra by mounting a scintillator around your detector. Compton suppression shields are custom made. There are many configurations possible, but it always starts with the size and the dimensions of your germanium detector, which we need to know in order to design the best system for you. So the MIDAT suppression shields can be equipped these days with silicon filter multiplier readout, which strongly reduces the size of the system and also therefore the size of your LED shielding. And plastic scintillator muon shields can effectively em eliminate the cosmic background uh, to a great extent. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Paul. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, before we quite dive into the Q&A segment, I just wanted to pay a little recognition to those who did have video and audio issues throughout the course. Um, while we are very excited to give these presentations, oftentimes they can be an ongoing project with figuring out the uh, most accessible method. The good news is, though, is that these are always live recordings as well as live webinars, and there will always be a playback after the fact once it is finished. And um, again, we sincerely appreciate everybody who's attended and helped us kind of further this. I see Daniel's, I see James's, I see people from all over the world, which is definitely um, one of our main goals when we set out on this webinar series. So again, thank you very much for your patience and for your attendance. And um, sure. yeah, with that, I guess we'll dive right into the questions. And I actually have uh, one here from Albert to start. Albert is curious if you could go into more detail about the difference between BGO and sodium iodide for sensitivity in regards to neutron activation. That's an interesting question. Um, all materials will activate uh, more or less. And we don't have much experience with activated suppression shields, to be honest. We have made many of them over many years, but I never had anybody asking me about the activation. But it's a fact you can activate both materials. It depends a little on the energy of your neutrons. Um, but I don't know a real good answer to that, to that question. Okay. Um, moving on then, I do have a couple questions actually. Um, we're on the topic of daisy chaining the mm -hmm. multiple detectors. The first is from Mason Yu, and he is asking, uh, by daisy chaining the suppression shield detectors, how sensitive is it to pulse pileup? And is there an upper limit to how many PMTs you can put together using this method? Well, um, the maximum count rate you can you can get out of a uh, scintillator, both sodium iodide or BGO, is roughly 250 kilohertz. Um, but this is still still possible with the proper electronics. Um, I never experienced a problem with that the count rate was too high uh, by daisy chaining. The, the count rates in general in compton suppression are not extremely high, also because the germanium detector is not able to cope with extreme high count rates. It has a quite uh, it has a special preamplifier on board required, and I never heard about extremely high count rates. Anyway, the dividers can be designed in such a way that we can uh, we can cope with high count rates up to a few hundred kilohertz if needed. Excellent. And then um, continuing on that topic of potential concerns, uh, Patrick Pappen was wondering if um, when daisy chaining multiple shields, um, is this affecting voiding by coincidence? For voiding? What's mean voiding? Uh, here, I'll read out the question verbatim. He is asking, any concern regarding daisy chaining signals from multiple shields affecting voiding by coincidence? I don't know the answer. Maybe you can put it on an email and I can think about what voiding really means. Of course. Uh, um, yeah. So, Patrick, feel free to email us. I'll go ahead and go back yeah. to the contact information page. Or I, I believe the word of the issue is voiding, correct? Maybe there's a different term for that. 
um, that you might be able to use to clarify. Mm -hmm. um, James Terry, I do see your question and I would like to answer it, but may you please uh, slightly clarify on what you mean by digital setup? Thank you. Uh, we have a question now from Tashi who uh, notices that the use of Compton suppressors complicates efficiency calibration. And he is wondering if it is still possible to generate an accurate absolute efficiency curve, or do you really need a standard for each individual analyzed nuclide? Well, I think efficiency curves can be, uh, can be put together by proper simulation, ISOCs, for example. And, uh, well, the, the suppression shield, of course, is something at, uh, around your germanium detector and will influence the interaction of your primary radiation. So you have to take it into account, but I think you can simulate this pretty carefully. I don't see a reason why you cannot simulate it, if it would in influence your efficiency. Sure, and as a note to that, uh, Mason, you did mention that they believe the intrinsic background of lanthanum bromide would be a problem in this case. Would that potentially be a well material. lantern bromide is not a, a low background material so if i would have to design a low background uh, system using a scintillator i always would use serum bromide and actually oh. we designed a, a low background uh, spectrometer with serum bromide and a bgo suppressor um, oh, paul sorry one moment i got um i got the questions uh, mixed up chronologically this oh. was actually from a dr haluk who is wondering about the effectiveness of the plastic scintillator shields on a lanthanum bromide scintillator to suppress background would there be a discernible effect there uh, you mean in a, a plastic scintillator you can basically also use of course as a suppression shield but it's not very effectively to detect complex scattered gamma rays because plastic has a quite low efficiency for high energy gamma rays so the, my experience is that people use plastic scintillators, which is of course nice because it's relatively inexpensive use plastic scintillators around the high resolution detector it can be a scintillator or it can be a germanium detector do not have a very good suppression due to the intrinsic properties of the plastic scintillator well, lanthanum bromide of course is a uh, uh, material which already has a relatively high background but of course if the intensity of your primary radiation is enough you won't see the background Okay, understood. Um, yeah, uh, going on to what I see here next, uh, C. Wen is wondering if you have any suggestions regarding underwater Compton scattering in X ray fluorescence measurement. No, I have no experience with that. But the fact, of course, is that water is a very effective scattering medium. Um, and X ray fluorescence, you're looking at relatively low energies. So I really would have to say the configuration, uh, what is looking at, and then uh, take some time to study it. So if he puts the problem in an email, we can uh, try to look at it and see if we can advise in such a way. All right, great. Um... Moving on to the next question then, uh, Wei Hua is asking, there are so many digitalization electronics available, such as the PIXI4 by an unknown company named to me, but it is XIALLC. Do you have any yes, I, I know this for you. Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a interesting, a very good question. Um, the point is that regular electronics is being replaced very rapidly with digital electronics. But to set up digital electronics is by far not trivial. Um, up to this moment, uh, the users have to find their own recipes, how to adjust this. And I'm trying to uh, convince the producers of digitizers, and well, there are a handful around, to bring out uh, more detailed manuals, how you set all those parameters in order to reuse these digitizers effectively with nuclear electronics. But I'm afraid we still have a way to go because it looks like that the language is a little different. But then certainly in the future, we need to aim to better manuals to operate digital electronics. I absolutely would support that. Excellent. Yeah. And then um, before any new questions, I did want to double back because Patrick provided a clarification by voiding, if you remember, yeah. they meant voiding yeah, yeah. the Compton event from the main detector. Does that help? Um, Stop the scanning from the main detection detector. Oops. Yeah. 
Uh, I started to think about it. Sorry. Um, let's get back to this in the in the break. Yeah. <laughs> as, is, as, right. they say at, as they say at the conference. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Definitely send an email. Then uh, Patrick. <laughs> so an email. Yeah, think about it. Or we can we can have a telecom for that matter. It's fine. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question is another from Mason Yu, who is asking, how specific is the suppression shield to the geometry of the high purity geranium crystal itself? Can you effectively use the same shield for a well type detector and a planar detector, which shares the same cryosat dimension? Yes, you can. You can. It's no problem by that. The main thing is that your your annulus, your scintillator should go around your germanium detector and it should fit. That's the most important thing. If you have an annular germanium detector, there's not much to uh, to to put around that around the annulus. You can't do much there. Um, so basically, I think yes, you can use the same shield for that purpose. Okay, excellent. Um, I have one question from a Dr. Rakesh Kumar, who's asking how much dead time is reduced if one switches from analog analog electronics to digital electronics they added the specifications for 24 clovers whoa this is a hard question um you really have to talk to the producers of digital electronics there they can but important of course digital electronics is the sampling time um, you have these things these things available these days with 256 kilohertz 5512 kilohertz so really we should talk to uh to the companies who can better answer you that um I think that the digital electronics is the future way to go also in this part of uh, uh, complex suppression spectrometry. All right, great. Um, oh, uh, looks like we have another question. It is, can BGO-based Compton suppression detectors be read out by SIPMs? That's a very good question, Alan. Um, the problem with uh, BGO is that it's not as bright as sodium iodide. And the other, on the other hand, the problem with SIPMs is that, that they are a little, a little, they are noisy. So with sodium iodide, we are able to achieve a very good noise level of roughly 20 keV, which is fine for compton suppression. In case of BGO, it is much more difficult. So for small compton suppression systems, small annulus, we may be able to provide you a decent suppression. But if we look at the current state of the art, large, PGO shields for clovers, for example, that made by Mirion these days, um, the noise is really too high to achieve a sufficient noise level. I think at best, with the current state of the art, we can get up to noise levels of 75 kV, which is actually a little too high to provide the best suppression. But it has not been really been tried um, to see how far we can go. Um, but at the moment, uh, the answer is uh, it is basically possible, but the results are not as good as for sodium iodide shields. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Looks like we've reached the top of the stack. So before more questions come through, I do want to quickly mention we've been going for about 40 minutes here. We'll leave five more minutes for questions and then we'll begin the wrap up. Of course, um, both Psionics and BNC are always available via email or uh, through other methods. So if you do not get your question in here or couldn't think of it in time, then always feel free to follow up. Perfect. Thanks everybody for listening. Yeah, thanks again. We do have uh, some people typing though, definitely ready to field those through. That's ours. Do we have some ours? Uh, here we go. Uh, so from Zachary, Zachary is wondering if the use of a SIPM changes the maximum count rate relative to traditional PMTs. The answer is actually no. We can run the SIPMs at pretty high count rates. With the proper bias generators we use, we have done some tests up to Kind rates of about 100 kilohertz, and we don't see any real problems. No. All right, interesting. Um, I don't see anybody else typing. Uh, I guess we can leave the floor open for a moment. Paul, are there any comments um, along the course of questioning that came up to you that you would like to mention? Or 
No, if anybody has more questions, feel free to contact us. We do our best. Um, all right, great. And um, while the questions are coming out, these last few, I also did want to bring a mention to uh, something I said at the very start, which is Berkeley Nucleonics Academy. Um, if you're looking to onboard more people into any field, whether it's RF testing or measurement, or even nuclear spectroscopy, we actually offer uh, curated courses that kind of also utilize our industry experience. Um, these courses are very detailed. We've received really good feedback. Um, I can go ahead and fetch that link and send it in just a moment. Uh, one moment, uh, James. Let's go ahead and drop that in there. As well, uh, here's a question from James Terry. Are there any recommended companies to ask about digitizers to replace NIM equipment? Um, he noticed that you have links. Is there any others? Uh, well, there are there are more and more companies these days. But companies who do digitize we have experience with is, for example, Kine or or Mirion, uh, Canberra, and but there are more around. Um, you can start with those. Awesome. Okay, um, I see one more person typing. Uh, oh, I actually have a question from a Dave Baruski who's wondering, Kane or Marion? Oh, he was responding to the other people. Apologies. Yeah, I see. I see a reply from Peter Dendoven who says a Mesitech. Mesitech is another one. That's right. XIA, Mesitech, Kane, and Marion, the ones I know, but there may be more coming up. All right. Um, I do believe with confidence that we have just about answered every question. Oh, one more question from Mark. Does Compton suppression require multi-channel digitizers? Well, um, if you, uh, you're talking about Compton suppression, we're talking about a primary detector and we're talking about uh, something around it to catch the scattered gamma rays. So we need anyway, two channels to digitize. First, your primary detector, and then the second one to be able to uh, to digitize a signal and set a veto. So you need two channels to be able to do the trick. Yes. All right. Great. And I think with the answer to that question, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. If we have not said it enough already, thank <laughs> you, everybody, for coming. It's just uh, awesome, you know, to have so many people in these live webinars. It has been difficult this past year. But, you know, both Psionics and BNC have remained open. And we thought, you know, this would just be a good way to start connecting again. Hopefully we can, um, you know, continue to provide support and start up those great conversations. Uh, Paul, do you have any parting comments? or? Nope. Thanks, everybody, again. Thanks again. All right. Bye.